the better idea called Mustang. The 1971 Super Beetle. Cars have names, names that evoke a certain feeling or image. Some grow out to become legendary model names, others are forgotten in the mists of time. Some model names are long and some model names are short, some are weird and others inappropriate. But when did car makers start to name their cars? And what goes into the process of coming up with a fitting name? Let's have a look at what goes through the minds of car companies who when they name their cars. Welcome to a literary 43rd episode of the Automotive History series that is about the history of car model names. Because what's in a name, right? First, let's get some things straight. Generally, a car is made by a car maker who gives it a name and various levels of equipment, called packages or trim levels. We're going to focus on the middle part in this episode. I'm not going to bore you by explaining where every car maker got their name from, nor am I going to explain the jungle that are trim levels and packages. You might think that coming up with a name for a car is the easiest thing ever. Coming into office, get inspired by a mix of morning coffee and a mood room, write down some names and send it to the marketing department, and go home enjoying an early retirement. But no, there is a lot more in the process of coming up with a fitting name. Usually car makers have a special team within the marketing department that comes up with names for their models and adjust the proposals after consulting with other marketing and communication teams to see how it would possibly perform in the car market, the legal teams to check for copyright infringement, the designers to see if they agree that the design of the car matches the name and the perceived image, and finally upper management. Sometimes the creation of names is outsourced to third-party marketing agencies, or just one person, or a computer or algorithm that will create artificial names. Or, you know, you let your employees do the creative thinking and pick one. The name for a new model should reflect what the car is about. The model name should evoke a certain feeling or image that reflects the intended purpose or market position of the car. And this is a lot harder than you might think. Naming a model can be a minefield. A lot can go wrong. Let's have a look. For starters, the model name cannot be a copy or look too much like other model names. Volkswagen will not suddenly make a Volkswagen iPhone. But there have been disputes in the past over model names. Think of the many Chinese copycats of the Western brands and the many lawsuits involved. On the other end, there are car models that peacefully share the same model name, like the Buick Century and the Toyota Century, or the Lexus LS and the Lincoln LS. Just because you have a name doesn't mean it'll sound right in other languages or parts of the world. Arguably the most famous is the Chevrolet Nova, also sold in Spanish-speaking countries, where no va means something like no go, or doesn't go, or doesn't move. Now, this story has been heavily debunked, the translation is not as literal, but it's still one thing to keep in mind. And what if you come up with a name that has no meaning but sounds cool in your local language, but turns out to have an actual meaning in other languages? Examples are plenty, like the Lamborghini Reventon, or however you pronounce it, where Reventon means flat tire or blowout in Spanish, the Mitsubishi Pajero, which means stroking the salami in Spanish, and the Mazda La Puta, which means prostitute in Spanish. Whatever you do, just don't sell cars in Spanish-speaking countries, it's always a miss, never a hit. And then there are names that absolutely represent the perceived image of the car, but just doesn't sound right. Ford named their pony car the Mustang, not Stallion. Chevrolet named their sports car the Corvette, and not the Sloop of War. And Volkswagen named their Golf hatchback after the Gulfstream wind, and not Fart, which very much is a human wind, and with an added H is also the German word for journey. What I mean by this is that the name should reflect the intended purpose of the car, and not lie about its capabilities that may or may not be there. Ferrari will never make the Ferrari Lumanca. The name sounds cool, right? But my Italian viewers will have to explain what it means. Nor Rolls-Royce would ever make the Rolls-Royce Jaywick, which sounds cool, right? But Jaywick has been recognized as one of the most deprived towns in the UK. And so we do have cars with somewhat misleading names. A Mitsubishi Space Star is not spacious at all. The Chevrolet Celebrity is not famous or associated with famous people driving them. A Hyundai Excel doesn't excel at anything. And a Cadillac Eldorado Baritz refers to A, a city of gold that doesn't exist, more or less, and B, a French seaside town that isn't even all that luxurious compared to Saint-Tropez or Monaco. But 
If you get past all of this, then you can start to play with all kinds of cool names. And here are some of the tricks that are used by car makers. Oftentimes, car makers prefer model names that start with the same letters as the brand. It just sounds right, like Chevrolet Chevelle, Dodge Durango, Toyota Tercel, Ford Focus. One sneaky way to get you think about a name twice is to make a pun out of it. Like Ford did with their Tudor model. Tudor is the name of an old English dynasty as well as an architectural style, but the name is applied to two-door models exclusively. Two-door, Tudor, get it? <laughs> or what about French Citroën in the mid-50s when they released the radical DS? To many of us, DS is just a combination of two letters, and it is. But to the French, it can also be pronounced as Dies, which happens to sound like the French word for goddess. Oh, what a fitting name. These are the names that do not exist or have no meaning, but reminds us a lot of existing words and yet we can't put quite our finger on it. Like the Porsche Panamera. It sounds a lot like Panama or Pan American or Pan America. Or the Mercedes Viano. It sounds a lot like the words Via and Van or Renault Twingo. I always thought it literally meant twin go, as in a mainly two-passenger car, but it's actually a combination of twist, swing and tango. Who would have thought? Anyway, let's get this all behind and jump into what you're really watching this video for. The history of naming cars. When did it all start? Well, from what I could find, the practice of naming cars followed pretty much the evolution from coaches to horseless carriages to cars. Before cars became mainstream, there was a wide variety of coaches, all with different names for their body styles, like Landolette, Brom, Coupe, Limousine, Berlin, etc. The new horseless carriages and early versions of cars, which look much like the carriages, simply took over the name of the body style and many of these names are still in use today, although their meanings have changed over time. Think of the limousine. By the 1910s, the first big car makers didn't put a lot of effort into naming their cars. It was strictly an alphanumerical business, if they named the contraptions at all. The Ford Motor Company simply stuck by going over the alphabet, naming their cars the Model A, Model B, Model T, etc. And others had a similar approach, but called their models Series, like Chevrolet, or Type, like Bugatti and Vauxhall. And then there were car makers that named their cars after the power output of the engine, like the Benz 10-30 horsepower, where the 10 was the taxable horsepower and the 30 was the actual horsepower, or the amount of cylinders, like Studebaker 6 or Packard 12, or the displacement, like the Bentley 3 liter. It seems like that around the start of the 1930s there is a shift happening. Some car companies start to abandon their logical series and numbers in favor of names that tell you a bit more about the car's intended image. This shift occurs right around the time car design starts to become more important for marketing purposes as well. These names were often modest and a bit expressionless. Think standard or custom, deluxe, mark and so on. One company that took quite a left turn during this time was Studebaker. They abandoned their engine-based model names in favor for a lineup named after political positions. The flagship was called the Studebaker President and below that the Commander. The lowest trim car in the lineup was the Dictator. Yes, Dictator. The name sounds awfully out of place today, but you have to remember that especially in the 1930s America, the word dictator did not yet have a negative connotation. The car's name was chosen because the model would dictate the standard. Dictators back then were seen as strong and influential leaders. This was until this man changed the definition forever, and the car was sold in Europe as the director. But besides all this, car companies started to see that in order to sell cars, the car should tell a story of what it is, through its design and through its name, but gosh darn it, a Second World War was getting in the way. After the Second World War, the car was more accessible than ever and countries all over the world embraced the automobile. This along with a prosperous economy, automakers celebrated the good times with even more stylish names and more stylish cars. Especially American car makers did not sell you a car, they sold you a dream. An escape. 
An escape from everyday life and a harsh reality. A name that reminded you of exclusive places you've never been, but where the car could take you. The stodgy custom and deluxe names were swapped for names that evoke luxury and exoticness. Think of names like Bel Air, El Dorado, Riviera and Belvedere. This was during a time the space race was in full swing, and this also influenced model names. Think of Galaxy, Jetstar, Firefly, and who could forget... One word. Thundercougar Fackenbird. One American model name I particularly like is that of Mercury. In 1957, it offered, for one year only, the Turnpike Cruiser. And I think it's an awesome, weird and pretentious name at the same time. It sounds cool, alright? But is it for the wealthy man that's only willing to drive on privately paid roads? Would this car be banned on public roads as it can only cruise on the toll roads? So many questions. And here is where you can see the Great Continental Divide. America was going crazy with far out model names. Europe took a more modest take on the model names or stuck with the alphanumerical nomenclature. Some car companies retained their model schemes, like the Germans. Others had numbers referring to engine displacement, like Fiat and Simca, with their 1,200 and 1,500 models, and only a couple car makers switched to the more fanciful names, mostly because they were owned by US car makers, like Opel. They changed their models to be named after diplomatic and army ranks, like the Cadets, Commodore and Capitan. Anyway, by the 1960s, the buying public was getting treated on the total performance era. In Europe, the sports sedan and the rally versions emerged, and in the USA, pony and muscle cars made their debut. And I don't have to tell you that you cannot sell a sports car when it's called the sloth. A strong, powerful or sporty name helps with the creation of a sporty image. But what is a sporty name? Many found the solution by looking at fast and dangerous animals. Ford took the Mustang name, although a reference to a type of airplane, it comes from the Mustang horse. And sister brand Mercury called their version the Cougar. Somehow fish, as unattractive as it sounds, became a popular choice. Plymouth came with a fish named the Barracuda, and AMC with the Marlin. And so did Chevrolet with the Corvette Stingray and Opel with the Manta. Why are you so concerned about this I'm fish? I'm just trying to understand how, it... how a person can buy a fish and not know what kind it was. By the 1970s, the focus shifted once again. Performance was on its way out thanks to the worldwide government regulations regarding safety and emissions. And car makers now jumped into the luxury and affordable luxury car market. Cars became glitzier and more glamorous, and so were the names. American car makers opted for European names that had something to do with the Mediterranean area for some reason, like Cordoba, Monaco, Monte Carlo, Seville, Riviera, Barcelona, and Granada. In Europe, many car makers retained their naming schemes, although some companies like Fiat and Volkswagen got rid of their cold, numerical approach and adopted themed model names. VW named their cars after different types of winds, and Fiat just named their cars after some utterly random Italian words, like June or Chrome. By the 1990s, a new breed of model names appeared, just pure fantasy that don't really make any sense at all, but still sounds cool? It's very much in tune with the postmodernist times. Think of names like Oldsmobile Alero or Intrigue or Opel slash Vauxhall with the Vectra and Aguila, or Nissan with their Maxima and Ultima names. Notice how adding the letter A at the end of the model name is a popular trick. This was all going to change by the start of the new millennium. Seeing the ever-increasing success of the German luxury brands and their solid way of boring number and letter combinations, other luxury car makers dropped their names to switch to their own version of the system in the hopes of joining the German success. What followed was a plethora of meaningless letter combinations and acronyms. Like Cadillac with the DTS, CTS, XTS, XLR, ATS, BLS, STS and SRX. Or rivaling Lincoln with the LS, MKX, MKC, MKS, MKT and the MKZ. And Acura with the MDX, RDX, TL, TSX and the RLX. Blah, 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 blah. Many of these car companies receive criticism that many of the names are too meaningless to decipher, and as of recent, many of these car makers switch back to more traditional names, seeing it simply doesn't work. 
Today, the world of car model names is still as diverse as ever. We have cars with complete nonsense names, cars with no nonsense names, and cars with alphanumerical nomenclature. This doesn't hide the fact that the name in one country doesn't necessarily just sound as good in other languages. Especially Asian car makers from Japan, South Korea and China have the tendency to name the cars in such a way that sounds downright weird to Western ears. Especially the Japanese K cars, the tiny compact cars, receive names that just don't translate to English, like the Suzuki Mighty Boy and the Daihatsu Make It. But also the Mazda Bongo Friendy. Friendy. And probably the craziest of them all, the Isuzu Mysterious, Mysterious Utility, Utility Wizard. 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 With the Chinese coming in, as of right now, so are there models with some peculiar names, like Build Your Dreams. Officially, it's the name of the brand, and it might inspire a lot of Chinese people, but over here in the West, the name sounds a bit pretentious, if you ask me. Or what about the Aura Funky Cat, or the Haval Big Dog? Anyway, you get it. And so, after naming some 100 model names in this video alone, I want to end with what I think is the most confusing car name of all time. Can I get a drum roll? The Chinese car maker Shuangwang proudly presents the all new S-CEO HB J6474Y.